Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephen Pilchik. I am the president of the Middle Atlantic region of the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. Welcome. The first thing is I would like to uh, ask everyone to make sure that your first and last name are uh, listed so that people can look for common familiar last names uh, from around the FJMC. I'll also let you know that we are going to um, be asking questions through Q&A. So if you're chatting with people and you have questions, make sure you put it in the Q&A and our guest tonight will respond to most of the questions, at least most that we have time for, um, from the Q&A. Um, the Genealogy Affinity Group's purpose, as we have it today, will be to share and improve the skills and capability of seasoned genealogists while teaching less experienced novice researchers some of the basic tools and techniques. That's not what we're necessarily doing in tonight's program, but overall. So I will ask that if you have any suggestions, any any needs or, or questions about how to's or program ideas that you'd like for the future, let us know. You can email the Genealogy Affinity Group and give us your ideas. We're always looking for new ideas moving forward. As you can see on the screen that I'm sharing, uh, this is a very old picture. As a matter of fact, it's 100 years old. Uh, this is the uh, Matseva, the gravestone for my great-grandmother uh, from the old country. And for anyone who's interested, that was in Stolen, which was in Belarus outside of Pinsk. What was so fascinating for me when I found this picture in my parents' picture drawer was that, as tradition has it, the person who is named is also named son or daughter of their father. And no one alive could have told me my great-grandmother's father's name, but uh, I don't know if you can see my, my little cursor circling Yaakov, which was an incredible find for me, and that just blew me away. So I became very interested in learning more about where I came from. I found family in Argentina, and one of the things that one of my new cousins said to me was, it's so great that we're connecting because how do we know where we're going when, unless we know where we came from? And that's what this journey is all about. So tonight, our speaker, Mike Carson, is a Jewish genealogist and researcher. He's engaging, he's an engaging professional speaker. He is a member of the Association of Professional Genealogists, the Genealogist Speakers Guild, and is a past president of the Gene Jewish Genealogy Society of Illinois. Mike's expertise spans over 20 years. He, is, he has spoken at most of the Jewish organizations in Chicagoland and at the international conferences, the IAJGS on Jewish genealogy. He has served as president of the Jewish Genealogical Society of Illinois and has published a website guide to Jewish genealogy in Chicagoland on Jewish gen. Jewish genealogy in his evolving pursuit is an evolving pursuit to discover who we are and where we came from. Many have heard that you cannot do Jewish genealogy, which is based on myths. These myths include that our name was changed at Ellis Island and all of the records that, are, that are, have been destroyed. This presentation will dispel those myths so that you can pursue your family's history. Okay, Mike, welcome, and it's all yours. Okay, well, I'm glad to uh, be here. This is a kind of a a different group you're starting out with uh, uh, all over the United States. So uh, I don't know where the farthest person is, but I assume you go from the East Coast to the West Coast. Um, so I'm kind of honored. And I want to thank Norwin for inviting me and Steve for kind of arranging this and being the uh, Zoom master of keeping these things going, which, uh, you know, isn't always uh, easy. So what, what I'm going to do today, again, is... Uh, Steve said it's kind of two, two parts, part the old, the old myths over here, and then try and go new science, which will be DNA, and kind of kind of try and bridge that big gap. Now, one of my normal measurements, and I'm taking a little risk saying this, is if people ask questions at the end of the talk, then you know, then I know they're paying attention or I touch them. Well, this group is so advanced that they've already sent me questions this afternoon. And I haven't even said a word yet. So um, so we hope we can get to some of those. And for those of you, if we don't get to the questions that you sent earlier, uh, my email will be on here. So I'll be glad to to come back and, and answer them. Uh, I have some 
some uh, answers for most of them, though. Uh, some of them are pretty um, advanced questions. So it sounds like you've been doing doing your homework. So I'm going to get started here. Uh, and, um, and, you know, as a good genealogist, we, we normally collect things. And I started early. And of course, the other thing that Jewish genealogists are famous for is going to uh, Chinese restaurants. So I got this fortune. And this was really when I just started, but kind of like a family endeavor will be a highlight. And I saved it uh, for some reason. And uh, again, my research spans now almost 25 years. I hate to say it, it seems like a long time, uh, but I've met over you know, 300 new relatives that I ne never knew before. Most of those I never even knew existed uh, before I started this. And then I, I went on an adventure as far as Perth, Australia, if you have some idea where that is in New Zealand and uh, Majorca, Spain and England, and France and Switzerland. So, um, and then also of course, Florida, we have a lot of relatives there. So, uh, so that kind of is kind of been the highlight. So uh, it's really kind of really changed my life in, in, in reaching out and meeting these people, the living people. Cause when I started, I thought the genealogy was only about dead people, but quickly I learned that there's the living people were really who were connected and we felt some kind of special bond with it was very, very unique. Okay, so again, I'm gonna talk about two parts uh, and I'm from the school, you can probably tell, but I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna tell you, then I'm gonna tell you, then I'm gonna tell you that I told you. If you can follow that, then you're good. Okay, so again, um, this was covered pretty much in the introduction and uh, again, I've I've also published five family histories. So I used to do uh, a lot of lecturing in that area. Uh, so well, here we are. So these are the kind of four major myths uh, that um, I have to dispel, and I still keep hearing the, <laughs> the first one, the Ellis Island. You know, no one's left. All the records. So I'm going to go through each of these. So I'm not going to talk too much about them now. But okay, so um, our family's uh, names were determined and most of American Jews um, come from this area known as the Pale of Settlement from Eastern Europe. Uh, and that's where we originated, came in the, uh, starting in the 1880s and the flock came through, you know, through the 1920s, that was the major. And this is Poland over here. This is Latvia and Lithuania up here. This is, uh, Belarus, Minsk, uh, Ukraine, and uh, those are those are the main places where our our people came, and they were kind of uh, forced to live there in those zones. And when I tell people, when I ask them what country they're from, or they ask where they're from, I say you stick with these kind of Minsk areas because those things didn't stay change. But if you said you were from Poland, I could say, well, some years Poland was everything, and some years it didn't even exist. So it's always confusing. So it's, um, and of course the old Jewish story is that the person grew up, they lived in four different countries, but they never moved from the same different, same house. So that was, that's that story. So um, unfortunately I couldn't find a Jewish person who is, issued a ticket, but this is the steamship tickets that the people got back in, in the old days. The uh, steamship companies would go to the hometowns of, of the people. This was a big business for the steamship companies because they put two, 3,000 people on, on these steamships. And even if it was maybe nominally $25 a ticket, uh, though you could understand, um, they would they would sell it there. That would be a good business. They would go to the hometown and they would write the person's name, this guy, Efonzi Plitz, um, bought this ticket, put his name on it. So that was his name. He put it on the ticket, brought that, uh, it was about two weeks before the departure. Then, uh, can everyone read this? No, they're just kind of kidding. Somewhere in here, I have a few little jokes, but I'm going to blow this up. Uh, but this is the the uh, manifest that people had, and there was a lot of information. This goes on for two pages, and I'm going to blow this up. This is my family here with the lines through it, which is another story. But when they got on the ships, their names were, their old Yiddish names, Frida, Moishi, Shloimi, and Etel. Those are the names that they carried. It was filled out in the port by some people who spoke those languages, and that was it. So there was nothing, you know, 
the thing. Well, he entered the thing and he, he said, whatever the people ahead of me are, I'll have that name. No, it was written down in black and white uh, with no ambiguity. And the other thing, of course, at Ellis Island, which I'll talk about, which of course wasn't the only port, but was the biggest, they had people who spoke over 50 different languages working there. It was on the Lower East Side of New York. All the immigrants were there so they could find people who spoke almost every language of the immigrants. So if there was, a, when there was a problem, they had somebody there who could deal with it. So all that story about, you know, the Americans giving them a name, you know, whatever. Uh, and then this actually was my uncle's immigration card that he, he, he had in his pocket. Um, Schloimi, again, Pekarski. Uh, it was filled out in Rotterdam on July 26th. And then it was stamped in Ellis Island on August 3rd when they arrived. So his name was clearly written on there, Pekarski. And if you wonder where Carson came from, well, you could cut a little off there and a little off there and you got Carson maybe. Uh, so that's kind of was my father's name when he came. And there's no documented case of names being changed, even though of course we hear that all the time. This is the most uh, famous myth of Jewish genealogy. Of course, when they came in and they had to get a job or do something, maybe Pekarski or Yankelovich wasn't a good name. They didn't want to be an immigrant. So they changed it to something uh, more acceptable. Of course, it didn't take too long for the people who met them to know they were immigrants, you know, but, um, you know, it, it was difficult. So that's kind of that myth. They came with a lot of documentation. It was filled out and it's good. Okay. No one is alive who knows anything about genealogy, um, about the family, you know, well, you know, now actually 25 years ago, I was finding the oldest person. Now I'm getting closer to being the oldest person, but um, what you have to do is call your cousins look who has photos and be a detective. I always say, even if the person isn't alive who might know the information, sometimes, especially I find where a mother and a daughter, the daughter, the mother shared a lot of information with the daughter. So even if that person isn't the oldest, sometimes they know um, and who has the photos. You gotta be like a detective. I have my detective hat, I won't put it on, but, um, that's the thing. There are people, and you can't assume that nobody knows anything, uh, and we're the only ones. So, so I went to visit uh, one of my second cousins who I had never known before, and um, I asked her if she had anything. Uh, she told me no, she doesn't really have anything on the family. But I said, well, why don't I come to your house? I'm going to be in Florida. Well, I was, yeah, I was actually 50 miles from her house, but I'll be in the neighborhood, and I'll just pop over. And then she goes under the bed and pulls out this, her mother's scrapbook. You can kind of tell it's one of those things that once you put the plastic over it and the thing glued on, you're never removing it. And it said dad's father. So this was her mother's photo album. She didn't know who it was. Of course, it turned out to be my great grandfather because his second cousins, that was our common element. So uh, this is Shlomo Tzvi Yosevich Pekarski, okay? from uh, Ukraine. And so you have to kind of not take anyone's word for it, say, I'm gonna come over, we'll see what you have. I found a lot of other people who have a lot of photos and of course they don't know what to look for. So you have to kind of find them and, and get to them. Uh, this is another photo that my cousin, we once had a cousin's club meeting and we said, well, everyone should bring a photo. And he shows up with this photo. I had never seen it before. Uh, this is like one of my first cousins. And I said, well, where was it? Oh, it was in my den hanging there. Well, who is this? This is my grandmother. Gee, I never knew, she, at this point, I never knew she was young. You know, I never saw her that young. This is her father, um, Yitzchak, who was the president of the butcher show in Jatomer. It's his wife. And this is my father over here, sitting on the little chair, looking very, very nice. And this is kind of in the old country because these folks never made it to America, um, whatever. But so you never know who has what. This is a first cousin. I talked to him a lot of times about the genealogy. He never thought that this was an important picture, but this is very important. Okay, all the records were lost in the Holocaust. So, um, you know, many records, of course, um, 
are preserved in the United States. We have ship manifests, we have, we have naturalizations records. The, the National Archive maintains all of these things and they provide very important records. And then also records from the 1800s are still in the archives of Eastern Europe and a lot of those things are being digitized and found today. The records from the communist era starting in 1917 those times, if your folks were still, family was still in Russia, those I think are pretty hard to find. But the records from the 1800s, every day I'm involved with some uh, of the SIG groups on Jewish Gen, and they're always digitizing and finding things. And then, of course, the other thing I did was hire somebody to go into the archives in Ukraine and Belarus who knew, knew their way around and uh, paid them to do that, which was very uh, worthwhile. So uh, this is the manifest, which I, I talked about before. And it says, you know, where they're going, where they came from, and the ninth, ninth, last name of the person in Europe who they were with, and their age. So that's a good start. The manifest is a very important document because it really links us. And I, I won't blow that up here. But um, And then, of course, even more important, I think, in a way, is, is the naturalization papers which again are preserved in the United States. You just have to find where they got their citizenship, where they live in the first five years they were in the United States. Most of our Jewish people were proud to be American citizens. So they, they went through that process. Um, and here, this is my great uncle, Max Blumenfeld. It says he was born in Butashan, Romania, uh, the date and where he lives now and the ship he came on. So if you can find this first, then sometimes you can go back and find him on the ship because you may not know on the ship he was not Max. He was Meyer or some other Yiddish name. You won't find Max Blumenfeld on any ship, but um, and his last foreign residence. So this is really one of the easier things to find because it has their Americanized name and um, it's well well preserved. You just had to find the county where they were uh, naturalized. Some of the records are actually online now more and more, but sometimes you actually either have to go or write to the county where they're from. Now, as far as the records in, in, in Europe, uh, this is from 1902 from the Book of Records of Marriages Between Jews. They had a separate book for Jews because we were a different group. And uh, if, you, if, if your Hebrew Yiddish is good here, you could maybe read Moshe Ben Shlomo Pekarsky, okay? And this is Rezel Bat Yitzchak Peltzer. So that, and it's also in Russian. I didn't really care for the Russian, but I hired a researcher and he, he found this because, you know, how would I find it um, if I was looking through those records? It would be very difficult. So that was kind of, okay, that's an important record. Um, this is the marriage of my great-grandparents, Kuna and Freda, in 1875 in Romania, in, in Botason or Botasani. That's a Romanian. I'll send that to anyone who can read Romanian. Uh, but this is kind of the, the translation. And again, it's 1875. And it says, uh, the groom's name is Kuna, son of Moshe, you know, age 22, shoemaker, his parents, his father was Moshe ben, ben Huna, you know, so there the name repeats with the grandfather every other generation. So in a lot of these cases, of course, the the grandfather was died, dead before the you know, son, so Huna was named for his grandfather. And then there's the mother's name and so on, and uh, the occupation, the bride's uh, Father was a sieve maker, which is kind of like a, a strainer kind of to, to, to filter things through. So that information back to 1875, their marriage record is there, okay? Now I couldn't find it myself, but I hired a researcher in Romania. Okay, 1834, Grodno, which is in Belarus, I hired a researcher and he found basically the census. It's, it's like a census. Uh, back there, and Leba Shimonovich Yankelovich, age 41, his son David, 
his wife, Freya, Freda, age 38. So if you say the records don't exist, I say mm, they do, okay? Uh, maybe they're not easy for us to find, but more of these are being put online. Every day there's an explosion of, of genealogy records available, but don't assume like, oh, we can't find anything. We're Jewish, everything is gone. It's not true. Uh, it's there and you just have to find it. Okay, luckily our family was not impacted by the Holocaust. Okay, well, um, many of our ancestors, especially Eastern European ones, came before World War II. We have some that went back to colonial times. They were the Sephardic uh, ones from Spain, Portugal, Netherlands. Uh, 1850s kind of was the age of the German Jews coming. And then, of course, the, the major migration of Eastern European Jews came. The bulk of them came between 1881 and, and 1920s. So if you're like me, you say, oh, gee, we were lucky because my grandparents came before the war. They came in you know, 1905, 1914. I'm all free and clear, not, not a problem. But the real question is, well, our ancestors came, but did their families come? You know, I showed you my grandmother's picture from back there with her parents who never came. It's her siblings, we don't have any record of them ever coming for my grandmother. Um, so, so what happened to them? Well, guess what? It wasn't good, uh, those that got left behind. And I, I searched Yad Vashem. And what I did is I looked for every family group I have, for the town uh, in Romania and the family name. And here I found a Bertha Blumenfeld, which is exactly my grandmother's name, who this was probably her first cousin who was murdered in the Holocaust. This is from Yad Vashem. These records are available online, uh, free, available to anyone. And here it says Bertha was born in Bolta Shani in 1873. She was deported and somebody reported this after the war. So, um, so they didn't come and guess what? They were killed. In, in Romania. Then I went to the Peltzer family, which was my grandmother I showed you with her parents. And again, I found people evacuated, people murdered. Actually, I found somebody now from this family who was actually uh, murdered in the Holocaust. The Peltzers from Jatomer, the same name, the same town uh, that didn't make it. And they were there in the 1940s when Hitler came and whatever. And I found individuals in every branch of my family where the names and the places match my family and places. So that's, you know, that's what happened. We didn't know about it and they lost communications. Of course, communications back in those days weren't great. And if even if our grandparents knew something, they probably weren't telling us or talking about it because it was too too horrific. Okay, so my family journey, I, I found this cousin, my cousin Ellen in uh, uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, her father served in the war and on his way home, uh, he stopped in Paris to see some family there. Now my grandfather, my great uncle, my grandfather's brother had been murdered, had been taken out of Paris and, and gone to a concentration camp. And when um, my cousin went to the house, he was given this patch by, by the widow of, uh, of my great uncle. Um, and then this is a document from the Red Cross about the son being taken into custody, but he, was, he wasn't killed. So that was one example where most of my family came from Romania to Chicago. This one brother of my grandfather's went to Paris, thought it was a safe place, but it wasn't. So that was an example, a specific example. So kind of summarizing kind of the first, I'll say half of my talk, the first part here is that these myths um, aren't true and we need to kind of get on with our research and not kind of make excuses for uh, 
not doing things, people would come into our genealogy society and say, I'd like to do my genealogy, but I don't, I don't have any records. Well, that's what we're about, finding the records because they're preserved somewhere. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little about DNA and I know quite a few of you know quite a bit about it. So I won't go too slowly, but uh, it's a whole new element that's available to us now to find relatives that we didn't couldn't find before. And uh, I won't go through the companies, Ancestry is the biggest and um, the most does the most marketing. So a lot of people use it, um, it not necessarily the best, but uh, this family tree DNA probably still has more a Jewish database, but if you're looking for people, ancestry is the way to go. It's very simple and inexpensive to do. Um, and they have these sales and now there's a lot of competition uh, on these. So there's basically three types of DNA. And one is the uh, Y DNA, which is passed down from father to son exactly. So it goes up one leg, father, 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 father. And it's pretty accurate. It can go back many, many, many generations matching. The problem with it is, of course, is if you go back more than three or four generations, back before 1800, even though you might match somebody, they'll probably may have a completely different family name because uh, the Jews didn't have family names before 1800. So that was one thing. The autosomal is the most common, and that's what you'll see on Ancestry and most of the sites. And that's the, the DNA we get from both parents. And it's kind of the mixture of it. And the mtDNA is uh, kind of comparable to Y DNA, except for um, the fact that the women have fewer mutations. You get so many matches uh, that it's almost unmanageable in a sense. So the other thing people do, of course, is they uh, they want to know their ethnicity. Uh, a lot of us Jews kind of think we know our ethnicity, but you never know. Uh, and this is kind of what Ancestry would look like uh, a while back. It says, um, you know, 88% European Jewish and some other little things. And this family tree DNA said I was Jewish diaspora for 98%. Now, people ask, Sometimes like, well, why do the Jews, why do we get that we're Jewish diaspora or Ashkenazi Jew as part of our DNA? You know, most people get their Italian, their Irish, their um, French. Well, because our genetic background, we intermarried so much and stuck together that we match our DNA. And that's the group we're mostly associated with. So that's why that kind of uh, is, is different. So um, I found a DNA cousin shortly after I did this, and I matched someone named John Christopher Kane. So the obvious thing is, gee, that doesn't sound very Jewish, especially the John Christopher part. Uh, I matched him exactly uh, an unlimited number 37 markers. So I immediately contacted him. He told me his father was adopted. Well, what really happened with his father his father was abandoned by his family in 1927, left in, a, in an office building in Manhattan with no identification, no note, and nothing. And uh, this is his, his father, Gordon Kane. This is what the newspaper article that they posted looked like. It said, does anyone know him? This little two-year-old boy was left and no one knows who he is. And nobody responded that they knew who he was. Now. I would say it's a little hard to hide a two-year-old boy, you know, boy for two years. So I kind of suspect that maybe they came from out of town. I don't know exactly, but this is Gordon as he grew up. Now, I don't know, I'll, I'll go closer. Could he be my cousin? Yeah, he could be, but he grew up with a Christian family. Um, but he always wondered what his ethnicity was. So this allowed him at least to know, uh, this is how, how the results turned out. Here he was down here, John Christopher Kane. We're off by two genetic markers. So that means we kind of had the same ancestor maybe back eight generations, six to eight generations. So it's really hard to kind of figure out exactly how we're related. The only thing I could tell him, I did speak to him before he died, is that he's definitely comes from Jewish ancestors, probably from the Ukraine back. That's where his heritage is. Uh, but we haven't really ever solved who his parents are um, and 
uh, where, where what, what that story was. So that's kind of a sad story, but at least this allowed him, there was no other way because there were no, not even um, adoption papers that had any information. So now we go to the autosomal. Uh, this is basic, you know, high school biology. We get 50% from each parent. And then every generation get 25% great grandparent. So by the time you get back to about great, great grandparents, it's pretty diluted, the DNA. So it gets a little harder to kind of match. Uh, and that's usually kind of what happens with, with a lot of our matches, that they're um, small matches, and then you really have to have some, some good insight into it to do it. So this is kind of what it looks like if you haven't done the research. This is my sister, full sibling, and there's something called centiborgans out here, 2596, if you could see that. So that means we're a pretty good match. Uh, cousin is 700. And as you go down, second to third cousin are 200 to 300. So as you get further away, and if you go back another couple generations, this thing keeps getting cut in half every generation. So it's it gets really difficult. But it's a it's a tremendous resource because uh, it's not never wrong. <laughs> I hate to say it. People say, oh, I got my results. And, it can't be true. Well, it is true. You know, I've never found anyone that that, that they, they redid the test that it, it came out differently. And I still don't know how this Rita Ann Goldberg Confeld is related to me. Um, you know, I haven't, I, I emailed her. The, the other frustration that happens with these things, of course, is that sometimes the people don't answer because they just did the test and they don't really care about meeting family or genealogy. They just kind of did it. For, for the fun of it and see what their what their heritage was. Okay, so I got this notification back uh, about uh, six years ago from uh, the Lissy, uh 76. And she says, oh, I think I'm related. Or I think you're related to me. So I said, okay. Uh, she gave a little information. So in this example, I'm going to show you that what you need to do is have done a little genealogy in most cases if you're going to match somebody that's not a real close relative. You've got to kind of have some insight. And uh, so this was her mother, Ruth Moskowitz. Oh, I said I had Markowitz as well. It's not close. Markowitz and Moskowitz are not close to being the same, uh, but um, we match at 172. And um, that, that's what the DNA thing looks like. I looked at her tree and I, I, I had to white this out because in, in hindsight, she put the answers in. So I have to do that. But she has Marcus's there. Now I have Markovich's and I have some family members who Markovich changed their name to Marcus. So that was kind of a common way of kind of Americanizing. Uh, though some of us may know Marcus is a pretty Jewish name but it's not quite as, as big as Markovich. And Markovich, you could spell a lot of different ways. So I got kind of on, on the clue there that maybe this Shlomo is somehow related to me through my Markoviches. Uh, then I looked more on it and she said, Shlomo is from Romania, which was good because my Markoviches are from Romania. And then I looked at my family tree and I have my great grandmother, Frida, Markovich, he was the one I showed you on that uh, manifest um, where she lived and she had a brother, Max. And um, so I'm trying to kind of match this Slomo Marcus with my Markoviches and see if I can put them together in some, some way. Uh, so I was doing all that research and I decided I better write back to her uh, the next day and tell her, yeah, okay, my, my family comes from Romania, from a place called uh, Botosani or Botoshan, depending on how good your Romanian is. And let's kind of uh, exchange more information. And um, she told me that her grandmother was someone called Sophie Albert Brown. Uh, and she said, also the name Marcus is in there somewhere, but she didn't know exactly how. Um, and she suspected Albert was her maiden name or married name. 
So the, the thing she told me, which was very important, is she's told me that her grandmother was sponsored to come to the USA by her uncle from Chicago. Like, okay, I'm a Chicago expert. I have, let's see how we can make that match work. So then I was able to online, this isn't uh, always possible, find the Sophie Brown's naturalization papers. Um, she had daughter, daughter Ruth was the person I matched. She was, said she was born in Yassi, Romania, which is pretty close to Botasan. And um, she arrived in New York as Sarah Solomon. So these names kind of, don't try and figure this out, believe me. Uh, but the naturalization was a good thing and it gave me her ship record. And then I went, um, found her ship arrival records, Sarah Solomon, she arrived then and uh, she signed it Sophie Brown. So up here she was Sarah Solomon and she was Sophie Brown. And then I looked more at the manifest and this is where I said, the manifest has a lot of information. Here's Sarah Solomon, uh, Romanian, a lot of information. And then on page two, she's headed to her uncle, Max Markovich, who, who was my great grandmother's brother at 1505 Washburn Avenue, Chicago. So there it is, right typed very nicely on, on the manifest. The early manifests weren't always that neat. And then I went, said, now, is that really my Max Markovitz? Because there could be more, more than one. But I looked at his na Max's naturalization papers and it matched exactly Washburn. So that was the connection that this was her uncle and that's how, how we were connected. But my point here is I needed to have enough genealogy skills even though she matched at 172, if I hadn't done my homework and had some insight, I would have never been able to solve this mystery. She couldn't have solved it because uh, she didn't have that genealogy experience, but she knew enough that we were related. Uh, and the final thoughts, her mother, Ruth, was 97. Um, and if I looked at my matches, she would be sixth on my list at 172. Lynn, her daughter, the one that wrote to me, was 21st on my list at 94. So she probably would have been kind of what we call below the threshold of where you look, because if you do these things, you can get a lot of matches. And one of the things you can really get frustrated very fast is when they don't match, uh, uh, what, what happened? So even though it seemed uh, like we should know those people, but I have never heard of them, or, uh, the Markoviches. So maybe my grandmother, knew about them and we just didn't see them or I was too little to pay attention, which is probably the case. Uh, and there's her picture. This is Ruth, uh, my second cousin once removed. And this is the daughter uh, Ruth, who, who wrote to me, Lynn. And this is the crazy kids, which is very good. They have crazy kids. Um, now, DNA testing, the other side of the coin is that um, you can find things that um, were hidden secrets that no one never wanted to go. You can find uh, people out of wedlock. Uh, someone does, you know, they're testing and all of a sudden, you know, they find out they're, they're half Jewish. Like, gee, I didn't know I was half Jewish. My parents aren't Jewish, you know, but her mother had an affair with somebody a Jewish person, and all of a sudden her DNA comes back 50% Ashkenazi and 50%, you know, Irish. So um, that's it. I have somebody yeah, who uh, called me over to his house <laughs> and said, I did my DNA testing. My kids gave me this uh, kit and I have this strange result. Well, he had a young lady that matched him, for those of you who've done DNA, at 3,400 centimorgans. So she was his biological daughter. Um, and he said, oh yeah, we looked at the names. And then he said, oh yeah, there was Susie at the office. We were very close. Um, so then I left, you know, after that, I'm like, okay, you're on your own. I don't know when that was, before he was married, after he was married, I don't know. But those things you can find out, uh, hidden adoptions, um, you know, People find out that they're adopted. All of a sudden, you know, 
people never are told and then they do their DNA testing and all of a sudden, gee, who are all these uh, people that match? They don't look like my family's names. Sperm banks. So I got a call, uh, some emails maybe about five years ago from a lady saying, gee, I've been, I did my DNA testing and I just found out that with my results that I have some Jewish blood. And I talked to my mother and she said, oh yeah, we forgot to tell you that I had to go to the sperm bank because dad was not really uh, producing good sperm. And they never told her that, you know, and the, some of these sperm banks, I think, led the people to believe that, oh, we're going to mix the sperm all together and we don't know what is going to come out. So this is kind of a, a moment of truth for a lot of people finding out uh, whatever name changes. So there's a lot of things that um, become, you know, difficult uh, questions, moral questions, um, whatever. You know, on the other hand, I have a friend who, you know, has found some people that were kind of out of wedlock uh, cousins. Uh, and that's turned out that they've kind of reunited and created a whole new, they included those people into their Jewish family. And those people never knew they had a Jewish father. So uh, there can be good things out of this, but there's also some risks. So, um, and then the other thing, of course, if you don't want to be pestered by a lot of people writing to you saying, oh, I think we're related and um, and you're not really interested in it. So, okay, so in summary, I think I'm almost on schedule. Um, don't believe the myths, you know, Jewish genealogy can be done. Uh, we're doing it. And uh, DNA testing opens up some new opportunities to find people. And it also has some risks. Uh, of course, genealogy, I don't have to tell you this very rewarding. This is my local chapter here. Um, and if you're not a members, uh, there's usually a Jewish genealogy chapter uh, close by somewhere. I think there's about 40 or 50 <clears throat> genealogy, Jewish genealogy chapters across the U.S. And today, uh, many of those are running kind of like we're running here tonight uh, on Zoom. <clears throat> and pro <clears throat> excuse me, and programs are online. So even if you're in some remote location, you can still be a member and go to presentations and learn a lot about genealogy. So let's see here. Um, there's my email. So um, if um, I'll leave that up there uh, for a bit, if, if it's okay with Steve. And we'll see if we have any questions. Um, and then I still have these mailed in questions, which were, were kind of, you know, home run questions for genealogies. So we'll see if I can help help with those. And if those of you who sent those in or um, have some other questions, if you if you want to just ask, send me a private email on your question. Um, but if you give me specifics, sometimes it helps me because I can kind of go on to one of the websites and say I have some idea of whether it's possible to find results in 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 a way. Um, so. Um, all right, Steve, I'm going to pong it back to you. All right, Mike, I, uh, you can stop the share. I, I put in the chat your email address. Okay, fine. Everyone can get that. Thank you very much for tonight. Um, we do have a little bit of time left, so I'm going to read through some of the uh, Q&A questions that were asked. So, uh, again, thank you for, for being here tonight and for sharing uh, your insights. So let's uh, let, let's jump right through this. Um from David Kaplan, I have a box of photos from 100 years ago or older that even my parents didn't know who they were. My dad was born in Boston 1919 and died in 2015. Is there any way these would be of value to anyone? Um, well, yeah, it's going to be hard to figure out. I mean, there might be somebody who knows what it is. I, I would I would keep some of them, some of them, that you know, uh, 10, 20 of them, uh, if you have a box of them that look like there's something important because at some point, you know, today there is some software that can kind of match people and do things. So you might find somebody who knows things, but uh, if you have boxes of them, I would just kind of preserve the ones that look, you know, are in the best shape and so, be most readable and, and get rid of the rest and, you know. So I'll add, I'll add two cents uh, from my experience. And I would say, David, 
first of all, reach out to your family and see if anybody would be interested because there might be other genealogists in the family who would like. And um, you never know who who would know. Uh, uh, Mike shared a picture that he didn't know existed. I sh showed my picture earlier on. So you never know. Um, Jim Schwartz, please discuss how one can find ship manifests. Well, the ship manifest, um, basically most of them are online. Um, there's a couple of good websites. Um, the, if they're searchable. I mean, there's an Ellis Island website. There's 24 million records on that. So if you don't know if he's Shlomi or Shlomo or how they spelled it, I would try and find the person's citizenship papers because that would be the first one. And then on there, they indicate what their ship is on, what ship they came on and what year. And then, then you have a better chance. Now, I will tell you this, sometimes I, I wouldn't say they lied, but they they didn't put the accurate date on there. Either they forgot or they were manipulating the naturalization thing because there was a, a time limit. So they might have changed the date. But that yep. would be the first thing I would do is try and get the citizenship papers. And there's someone called stevemorris.org who has tremendous search forms. But if you if you don't know too much about it, uh, looking for 24 million records um, can get very frustrating very fast. Um, uh, and okay. uh, so that that's but uh, it's a great record to have. It's, it's one of the most important meaningful things for us as we kind of became Americans that our, I'll say our grandfather, grandparents or great grandparents came across. I, I think this could make a great topic for, for a whole hour. I will yeah, tell you sorry. that aside from the, the, the citizenship papers, which you real, that will, will list a ship, but there's a document that is like a five by seven index card called a, a certificate of arrival. And that lists four really important items, the name, that the way that it was spelled that the per, the immigrant came over on, the date they came over on, the name of the ship, or maybe it's three items that they came over on. And that's usually a, 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 together with the citizenship records. So the certificate of arrival uh, really nails down exactly what it is. Um, as Mike said, stevemorse.org is a great site. The Ellis Island site is now called statueofliberty.org. And one other site that I found while we were just listening um, if I can show, um, uh, I'm not going to be able to show it, so I'm not going to do it now. But there was a, um, there, 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 there's, there's sites out there. And uh, Jim, you can reach out to me and I, I can get you some more information. Uh, David Kaplan asks a question. Any suggestions on how to track someone who clearly wants to cover their tracks? <laughs> well, uh, somebody. Short alive. answer, Mike. <laughs> Good luck. Um, someone who's alive, it's, um, well, there's, you know, my you know, uh, whitepages.com. There's a lot of online directories where you can find people. And in some of these white pages, then they give other names on it. So if you have Sheldon Cohn or something, then it gives other people in the family, his wife, kids, that can kind of maybe narrow it down if you have any idea where they live. Um, and the question is, once you find them, will they answer your calls? <laughs> or not but um yeah there's some there's some search engines to find find people living people I assume you're trying to find living people um and um you know good luck and, and, and sometimes, sometimes. If, it, if it's if it's ancestors who who maybe their names have were changed the citizenship records will will show it they'll show what their name was and what their new name is um and and that may help I, I want to go back for one second also to the question of um, f discussing uh, how, how to find ship manifests. Something else that if you have very little good to go on is if you can find the people you're looking for on census records, census records often will ask what year they immigrated. Now, it doesn't mean the way where they weren't guessing, and it doesn't mean it's always going to be right, but sometimes it can help narrow down the search. Um, the records that are online are from the 1880s to the 1940s, and it, 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 it's really hard to figure that out. But if you can narrow it down to a couple of years, it might make it easier. And always try spellings that you can think of, because as the Steve Morse site lets you do Soundex searches. 
So that helps too. Um, Bruce, uh, whoever Bruce is, asked, my father's uh, name was changed from Klein to Fleiss when his parents married. Is there a way to find out if I have Kohan, Kohan lineage? Um, I, I'll just add something that one way is is to do some DNA uh, because there are there are tracks that that try to to put those together. But Mike, do you have any other thoughts? Well, uh, one of the places, of course, is a cemetery. So if you go back um, to a male in that line, your grandfather, whatever, um, they would put Ha Kohen on the on the tombstone uh yep. if it's a a proper hebrew tombstone so right. that would be it's usually pretty accurate uh i think you know and of course there are certain names cone cats some some names of course khan that lend themselves to being kohanes but those aren't that's not proof i i i think the cemetery you know i don't know if you find a ketubah from somebody god god bless you uh, <laughs> that would say his name but uh, the cemetery would be uh, the best the best way to find some male in that lineage. You know, right. It doesn't have to be your direct relative. It can be a great uncle or someone yes. else w w who's in, in that uh, in your lineage there. Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. All right. Let's see. Are there any websites you uh, MW? OK, we get even shorter. Any <laughs> websites you recommend for searching international records? Uh, M is Martin. Well, I think um, actually Jewish Gen is pretty good now. Uh, if you're familiar with that, they have a Romanian database, Ukrainian database. There's uh, Polish uh, databases. So those are uh, those are pretty good, and you might want to get into if you know what country, of course, uh, they're from. You, you're going to need to know something. Um, then get onto that group. There's what they call SIGs on, on Jewish Gen, and you know, watch the things and ask a few questions. But uh, there's more and more records online today. Every day they're digitizing, and they're always looking for volunteers to translate the stuff. But um, it's a lot different than it was 20 years ago when I started all this. Yeah, yeah my, my heritage, heritage. Uh, is, I have found my heritage to be used a lot more by people outside of the United States. Um, so there's good connections there. And then the full version of Ancestry has uh, records that are downloaded from around the world. Uh, Jewish Gen, as Mike just said, and, and even Family Search uh, has, uh, has records that are um, outside of, of the country. I found, I don't know if it's the only document, but I was looking for a death certificate from South America and it something it was helpful, not not exactly what I was expecting, was posted on Family Search. So uh, a lot of things to look there. Um, a question that was posted in the chat was, what DNA site is best for Y DNA testing? Well, that's an easy one. It's a family tree DNA, because that's the only one that does Y DNA. Uh, so, but yeah, so, but it, it's limited. But if you, if you met somebody, they're going to, be a, a, a real descendant from your your father uh but if you go back again four or five generations the name won't be pekarsky anymore <laughs> they had changed something before 1800 so but uh it, it's good uh you know I, if you want to do the y dna um it's a pretty accurate test Mike, I have a question for you. you. You mentioned early on that you you hired some genealogists to do some research back in the old countries. Just quickly, how how did you find someone you thought would be good to use? Well, usually what I do is, again, I use this Jewish gen. I post something on the Romanian SIG. I say, I'm looking for a researcher. Perfect. And I usually say, I'll, I'll email you privately. They don't like to do this public. And then you can ask right. them, well, how much is he costing? Uh, because you have to be careful. There's still people who are unreliable Absolutely. out there. You send money to Romania, and guess what? Good if, luck. If anyone uh, doesn't know, JewishGen.org is one of the oldest. We're talking decades, of course. Um, gene Jewish genealogy websites. It's free to register. Um, there are some paid advantages, but there is a, a slew of 
resources, SIGs that Mike was referring to. Um, again, a, another couple of hours could be spent on it, but if you're just getting started in your Jewish genealogy research, go out there, sign up and, and go to town. It, it's, uh, or go to shtetl. It's, it's shtetl, really, yeah. um, it's really shtetl. great. Uh, any other uh, questions you can certainly unmute yourselves, but, um, we have still uh, a number of people and I don't, I don't know if everybody talking at once is going to be great. <laughs> um, let's see, did I, uh, oh, more questions. Um, no, nope, I think I got to everything. So if I if I did miss something, please um, please feel free to speak up. Please repeat the DNA. The DNA. It, what's the question, Sally? Um, I, and I'd like to share. Well, if Sally's typing, I'd like to share one other comment about DNA testing. DNA testing is wonderful, and like Mike said, it's going to point you in directions, um, but you have to do the work to to connect the dots. Um, you might get a hit of uh, that that's a pretty strong hit of people you just don't know, and it's up to the two of you or you to do, be the detective and figure out, okay, here's a starting point, because most of us who have Jewish DNA in us um, do this test and find thousands and tens of thousands of connections. Most of them are because we're all related to each other. The ones that are closest relations are the ones that will take some, some pardon the expression, digging. I'd like to, if, if everyone can read my mug, my wife got me. I research dead relatives and annoy the crap out of the living ones. Okay. It is very true when you get the bug. Name of the DNA test uh, site. So there are many, Sally, uh, but the four largest ones, Ancestry, 23andMe, MyHeritage, and FTDNA. And I will also add that if you test on Ancestry or, or 23andMe, and some people like to test all around, you can download the results and then upload them to MyHeritage, FTDNA, and a place called GEDmatch. And it's good to get, if you're going to do the DNA testing and you really want to try to reach connections, it's a great uh, idea to get it out there in as many places as you can. Okay, Mike, you had the... Um, you, I have a few had... qu questions that were sent in. Yep. And maybe, maybe we could do a few of these. Yep. Um, and then we'll close. So Someone asked about the Arlson archives, which is they were collectors of uh, by the Red Cross of a lot of Holocaust information. They do have a online website. I, I went on there today and they have some information there, uh, but a lot of it I had to send in. I found my people, but I they didn't have the data online. So I had to send the request in. The other piece, place that's good for uh, Holocaust people, if you think, is that Yad Vashem, which I mentioned in my talk. Again, if you put in the names of the people there, um, what they have is pages of testimony where somebody in the family filed a, a, a report that this person was murdered in the Holocaust. So those, if you have Holocaust people, uh, those are the two best places to look and uh, whatever. And those things, again, are available free and online. Um, the Arlson, once you send them a request, God bless you when you get an answer because they got gazillions of requests. But that was kind of a collection of a lot of the Germans, of course, kept good records, um, as we sadly know. So um, whatever. Uh, so, OK, so that's that's it. The, um, the other people asked, uh, how can I find a local heritage tour, uh, like if you wanted to go to Romania or, or Belarus or somewhere. I, again, I think Jewish Gen is the best place to kind of go there onto the SIG for the, for the country you want to go to <clears throat> and see what uh, asks there. You know, there are tours that, you know, of of the genealogists that go go to these places and 
help you go to the archives. Of course, try and do as much research before you go. I know people who just go and they, you know, if you can find some records, addresses of where people live from manifest or something, that'll be a big, a big help uh, when you get there. Just don't say, well, I'm looking for all the Carsons here and see if you can pick up the phone book. Uh, do do your homework. So when you're there, you're, you're uh, getting the most out of it. Um, yeah, I think uh, we had a question about the Cohanes. Um, yeah, and then the, there was one that was more specific. Again, if you if you sent it in, Steve, if um, those people want to write to me or I've triggered any other thoughts, I like getting emails afterwards. It kind of again tells me that uh, I touched touch a thing or you have some uh, difficult thing, and sometimes. I don't know all the answers, but sometimes having somebody else look at it um, helps to at least ask you a question. Did you do this? Oh no, I didn't. I didn't think of that. Um, so uh, I'd be glad glad to help with that. And um, I think we're uh, about at my one hour time limit according to my stopwatch here. So um, I'll turn it back to Steve. Well, Mike, uh, thank you once again for a, a most enlightening. A uh, uh, presentation uh, about trying to uh, dispel some of those myths. Um, if anybody has any more questions or or uh, suggestions for future topics, please let us know. All right. Well, so Mike, thank you once again. Thank you all for being here. And with that, we will stop the recording.